happy Fourth of July, everybody. Uh, but uh, we, I can officially announce that we blew through the Malawi, the Asman Malawi challenge, and uh, uh, church uh, members met the challenge and surpassed it. Uh, we collected more than six thousand uh, dollars to go to the Malawi uh, Malama Cholo. Uh, uh, feeding station. And so thank you very much for your generosity and uh, meeting the challenge and thanks have been conveyed to Don and Judy Asman for their uh, wonderful generosity and uh, their, their continuing to support uh, Malawi. And uh, so that, that was a, a good news for, for us. Um, are there any updates for Logos Bookstore? Uh, well, basically, no. <laughs> I will just say that we are uh, waiting uh, impatiently and we are continuing to pray, but um, it's kind of not looking good, but we'll just have to see what happens. Okay. Please continue right. to pray for us. Thank you. Prayers will continue for a stable location for Logos. All right. Um, I, um, uh, I think this is the first time on Zoom that I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> and uh, I was... Uh, I had to, I, I uh, had to remember that I'm actually doing communion in the in the sanctuary this morning and makes a difference what I wear. <laughs> so, but it's good to see you all here, and uh, we're uh, let us begin. And Carl is our reader this morning. Call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And our hymn is Fairest Lord Jesus.
Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, today is the 4th of July, America's Day of Independence. Songs celebrate this day. Movies have brought it to life so many times from real life history to wild science fiction. And yet this July 4th, America seems fraught with uncertainty and trouble. The state of our union is bad and getting worse. We're in the process of finding out indeed whether a nation divided against itself can stand at all. All this while at the same time so many great and consequential things are happening. From the continuing spread and mutation of the coronavirus to our troops leaving Afghanistan after 20 years of war, leaving the fate of that country very much in doubt. To the record-breaking heat waves and other extreme weather occurring on the mainland and around the world, we might feel like we are in an over-the-top action adventure movie. But if there are any superheroes to be found, they will have to be found among ourselves. So we pray for our nation, for ourselves, for our world. May we be freed from fear, the fear of change, the fear of the other, the fear of those not like ourselves. May we be freed from lies shouted from the rooftops with no correction or consequence. May the ongoing erosion of our fragile social fabric be stopped and even reversed, lest this become one of the last Independence Days we see before another civil war breaks out. Indeed, in ways already, we seem to be at war with one another, as when one political party largely denies the results of our last election and plots to undermine any future election. Millions of self-identifying Christians are at the core of our national crisis. Can the church be part of the answer as well? Can reform and repentance happen soon enough and widely enough to make a difference? We pray that it may be so for the sake of our nation and the world. And we continue to pray for the victims of the Florida building collapse, as well as for those in that state who are in the path now of the first major storm of the season. We continue to pray for Shane and the few hundred other young, young boys who have experienced serious reactions to the COVID vaccine. And we continue to pray for the millions who have lost loved ones to the pandemic. May the world quickly receive vaccines, no matter where or how poor a nation may be, for among the poor is where we no doubt would find Jesus today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken. We pray in the name of Jesus and with the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, our scripture reading from Mark chapter 6. Let us hear the word of God. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom 
that has been given to him. What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thanks, Carl. There's a cliche about the martial arts and water that rather than confront an opponent head on, one should be like water, yielding, flowing, fluid, always finding another path while also being relentless and persistent like waves on a shore. In the two stories from our text today, we can see Jesus doing something very much like this because in the way that Mark tells the story, this incident where Jesus meets rejection in his hometown synagogue is the last time we see Jesus in a synagogue. And the next thing Jesus does is send out his disciples with neither money nor provisions, making them dependent upon the kindness of strangers. And rather than enter synagogues anymore, they're to stay in homes, in ordinary, humble homes where they find welcome. Gospel Kung Fu. Go with the flow, but keep going. The crowd in the synagogue begins with amazement. Where did this man get these things? What are these mighty works wrought by his hands, as the King James Version translates? Isn't this the carpenter? Carpenters back then, unlike today, were very low on society's scale of respect. Carpenters' hands got dirty after all. They put up walls and signs. They didn't perform signs and wonders. In the first century, according to scholars, honor was a limited good. If someone gained, someone else lost. To be recognized as a prophet in one's own town meant that honor due other persons and other families was diminished. So claims to more than one's share of honor, which came at your birth, thus threatened others and would eventually trigger attempts to cut you down. It's like the old Japanese proverb, nail that sticks up gets hammered down. The crowd's reaction here, though, reminds me of the two balcony curmudgeons in The Muppet Show, Statler and Waldorf. They're the two old guys who love to ridicule any performance, but they often begin one way and end up in the opposite place. I loved it, they start, but then things change. It wasn't bad. Well, it wasn't particularly good. It was kind of lame. I hated it. And this seems to be what's going on here in Mark's story. Wow, what amazing miracles it starts out. But then, wait a minute, we know this guy. It's the carpenter for crying out loud. It's the son of Mary. And by this, many suspect a slur with Jesus' unusual birth story. He should have been called the son of Joseph. We know his brothers, they said. 
And Mark here tells us that Jesus also had sisters. Both Matthew and Mark give us this detail. Can you imagine that Jesus had baby sisters? I would have loved to, I would love to see a family portrait. The synagogue crowd, though, thought they knew all there was to know about Jesus. They had seen him grow up. As the saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. And as Eugene Peterson translates, they said, who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him. The offense taken by the synagogue crowd foreshadows the offense taken by the Jewish leaders who will actively oppose Jesus. And then the Passover crowd in Jerusalem that will call for his execution. From the beginning, Mark tells us, Jesus met with resistance and rejection. Is there something we can learn from the way he responded? Is it a coincidence that Mark moves from the synagogue rejection story to the sending of the 12 to sow gospel seed in ordinary homes? Probably not. Because if we look at how Mark describes homes, teacher Ched Myers points out, what we find is that in every case but one, the house in Mark is portrayed as a safe site for the discipleship community. In Mark's gospel, Jesus dines with the outcast, attends to the crowds, offers private instruction and healing in homes. Only once is the house a site of conflict in Mark, and this is when Jesus' own family comes looking for him. And as we know, the early church was always a house church. There were no church buildings as such, not for three centuries. Jesus first went to the established religious settings of his day, the synagogue and as well as the temple. But when resistance emerged and minds and hearts closed to him, he didn't demand or argue or defend himself. He did the be like water thing. He moved on and found a new venue, which planted the seed for the church. Jesus' instructions to his disciples also give us much to ponder in our own day. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. In other words, like Jesus himself, his disciples are to venture forth in need of the kindness of strangers. They are not to try to pay their, their own way and be self-sufficient. They're not to avoid imposing on the generosity of others. They are to be as poor strangers and sojourners in their own land. Why? Why not try not to impose on others? Why be so needy? Impose on other people? How irresponsible, how rude, isn't it? Since Mark doesn't give us Jesus' reasons for doing this, we can only guess. But to me, two things come to mind. First, that they were living by faith, trusting in God's provision, surely. But second, their need created the space for instant community and relationship, the essence of church today. The thing about the American model of self-sufficiency is that if you are self-sufficient, you don't need anybody. And if you don't need anybody, why bother with the church? By sending his disciples out with nothing but the clothes on their backs, Jesus created the conditions for the gospel to be received. Because those households that demonstrated hospitality were also the likeliest places where a receptive audience would be found for the good news. Where households turned away the messengers of the kingdom, likely as not, were also hard hearts, resistant to any gospel message. Gospel Kung Fu, go with the flow, go empty-handed. The growth of the kingdom of God does not depend on particular places. It depends on receptive hearts. And what was the message offered by the disciples? Verse 12 simply says, they went out and preached that people should repent. We know the word repent means to turn. 
And we, we are probably naturally inclined to think first of what we are most familiar with. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus. But notice here, that's not what Mark says. If we were looking at a scripture like Romans 10, yes, the message is about Jesus. But the fact is, here in the Gospels, Jesus does not instruct the disciples to make the message about him. Instead, he gives them authority, power over unclean spirits, and to heal. These are tangible signs of the presence of the kingdom of God. And with the disciples being the ones to carry out these acts, they become participants in what God is doing. They become signs, foretastes, and instruments of the kingdom. I like what a blogger named D. Mark Davis says about this story. He refers to the so-called messianic secret, where Jesus often tells people not to speak about what they had seen him do. The theory is that Jesus didn't want to create too much of a fuss too soon in his ministry, lest his mission be cut short. So keep the Messiah stuff secret. But Mark Davis has another thought about this, which I like very much. He says, by attempting over and over to make Jesus the Messiah, people were missing the point of his message, which was that the reign of God, the kingdom of God, was present and that they were all invited to participate in it. Davis suggests that focusing only on Jesus caused people to miss the invitation offered to them to participate in the life of the kingdom itself. He notes that to follow is more about joining along, taking up the message. Indeed, taking up the cross that is central to the message, he says. And by believing, Jesus meant living in the present reign of God. So it's the healing the sick, delivering those who are oppressed that the disciples engage in. In other words, the gospel is not to be just heard and shared. It's to be lived out. The gospel call to repent, therefore, may be understood like this. In Mark's day, it meant repent and turn from life under the Roman Empire to life in the kingdom of God, which might translate in our own day as repent and turn from life in the American Empire and participate in the kingdom of God. So what might it be like for our church to live and demonstrate the kingdom of God? This is the question we've been asking for a long time now. It's the question of faithfulness. But have we thought of this along the lines of gospel kung fu? The pandemic forced us to flow onto the internet for our services for more than a year. And we discovered that indeed a church can be the church in a way that none of us had ever imagined being the church before. When the pandemic came, most of us didn't have everything we needed for this new life. We relied upon the generosity of others, of family members, many times younger family members. We relied upon church members, upon strangers, upon the government as well. It's been difficult and there have been losses, but there have also been gifts and gains. We can see the hand of grace in the last year. Hopefully now we are emerging from our lengthy time of pandemic measures. We're not out of the woods yet, but thankfully we are able to exercise a bit more freedom. As we do so, we return to our church's challenges. You'll be hearing soon about a project to replace the balconies of the CE building. And you'll also be hearing about a project to upgrade our social hall elevator. These projects together will cost more than $200,000, which we can manage thanks to your generosity and faithfulness. But we will need much more for the church overall. And so we return to the challenge of stewarding all that is entrusted to us. In this context, I offer you three gospel kung fu thoughts from our story. First, we must continue to wrestle with what is essential and what is not. 
What is striking in this story is that though the synagogue had been a fixture in Judaism for centuries by the time of Jesus and his disciples, when it came to it, Jesus did not treat the synagogue as essential to his gospel. Jesus shifted his focus from the synagogue to ordinary homes. Many of you were involved with our flow meetings and discussions. You know that this was and is a key question for us. What is the church, a building or a people? And it's a very complicated issue, but perhaps Mark's story of the gospel being sown in homes can serve as a reminder. Because second, the focus was on relationships. The gospel takes root in people, first of all. Gospel seed requires human hearts, not just the building, no matter how special. And most of us know that this is the way that our own church, Makiki, also began with Reverend Okamura's outreaches. Third, the gospel is to be demonstrated, not just described. The gospel invitation calls for participation, not just for agreement. The way the gospel was demonstrated by the disciples addressed what oppressed people, from the demonic in the spiritual realm to illness in the physical. And from what we know, this continued to be a hallmark of the early church. The church today faces great challenges. Our prayers and conversations need to continue. I have no doubt that the good news of Jesus will continue to spread and grow here and elsewhere, as it has from the beginning. And it will also spread and grow in new ways with flexibility and creativity, the way of gospel Kung Fu. Let us pray together. Gracious God, may we wrestle with our own call to faithfulness. By your spirit, may we discern the essential from the non-essential. May we offer our lives and our life together as the host for your gospel. By so doing, may we serve as an instrument of your kingdom's good news. For Jesus' sake and in his name, amen. Now, please take a minute to prepare your own communion elements, and we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. All right. Community of saints, those who know that we are God's blessed ones. Once again, we are invited to gather at our virtual table of love and freedom to be offered the bread of heaven and living water gushing up to eternal life. God calls us as we are from wherever we are to come and be together with Christ who tabernacles with us along our wilderness way. Blessed are those, Jesus said, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So let us come to the table expectant, grateful, and open to tasting the rich blessings of heaven offered in unexpected places, people, and experiences. In this meal, we remember the life, death, and resurrection of the one who still takes on flesh among us today in the body of Christ. On the night he would be arrested, Jesus gathered his friends and companions. In the midst of a tense and dangerous time, they found each other at table, remembering the Exodus story, the Passover. And as they did so, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread and shared it with his disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he also took the cup, 
gave thanks to God and shared it with his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, breath of God, renewer of life. Settle on these gifts and on all who gather here, that we might be transformed in our remembrance of your radical love, your eternal embrace, and your grace that makes all things new. May this meal be for us, bread for our journey, and nourishment for our participation in your kingdom coming ways. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, the gifts of God for the people of God. Partake and remember. Let us pray. God, by the bread of heaven and the cup of life, you make us one body. Bind us together by your spirit that we might live into your hopes for us to be a community centered in Christ and rich in compassion, commitment, courage, and care. May it be so. For Christ's sake and in his name, Amen. And let us together affirm our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ is coming again. And now receive the blessing of Christ. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and go with you wherever you go throughout the coming week and always. Amen. And now feel free to unmute and pass the peace of Christ among our